All right. Yeah, okay, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. This is the Kilovolt presentation, best practices for design, installation, and operation of the Kilovolt Hab. And uh, we are going to be rolling here very shortly. I just wanted to give a couple of housekeeping uh, messages first. We will, with, with everybody that we have in the session today, we're not gonna be able to have live questions and answers. After the session at three o'clock, or after all uh, three of today's technical sessions at three o'clock, there will be an open networking session and you're all invited to attend that. At that session, we will have uh, a couple of tables for Kilovolt. You can meet with us one-on-one uh, -on -one and uh, ask any questions that you may have. There'll also be representatives from the other companies that we're presenting uh, today. That would be Morningstar and then uh, after this presentation, Schneider. And we'll also have representatives there from Alt-E that can answer your questions. So uh, that's one way to get questions answered. Another way is if you look at the bottom of your screen on most devices, you'll find a little Q&A button. And if you click on that, you can post questions to the panelists here and we will do our best to answer them uh, directly in the Q&A session, or uh, if it's of general interest, we may bring it up to the, the overall group as well. So that would be the best way to get your questions uh, answered. And so with that, I am going to ask um, Nate, if you could share uh, the screen there. We've got Nate and Marlon online here with us today. Perfect. And let's see, now we need to, uh, need to get, there we go, okay. And I see we do have a question from Glenn asking about NABCEP credit. And um, for the sessions that are offering it, those will be, uh, you know, sent out, we have a list of who's in the various sessions and we'll give that to the various um, uh, presenters. This particular session, the Kilovolt one, is uh, not NABCEP uh, approved yet because we have to do some paperwork on our end. So it's just kind of a timing thing. But for this session, uh, it will not be um, getting credit for that one. So apologize for that. And with that, let's get started. So today we're here to talk about the Kilovolt HAB 7.5 uh, design, installation, and operation. Before we get into that, I'd like to just um, uh, talk a little bit about Kilovolt in general uh, as a as a background there. And it looks like I'm having some trouble getting to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Kilovolt, uh, we, you know, we pride ourselves in providing innovative and affordable renewable energy solutions, uh, primarily for residential, but we also do have some products like the uh, Kilovolt have that are appropriate for uh, light commercial applications as well. And we design, market, and sell uh, energy storage products and uh, look to really keep the cost of them down uh, to reduce the cost for homeowners and others. And also, you know, to help everybody go in the green direction that, that we all uh, believe in. So that's kind of our overall mission. Now our product line, for those of you that may not be familiar uh, we have several product lines. All the way on the left, we have our portable emergency power unit, the Rescue. Today, we're going to be talking uh, for the balance of the presentation about the HAB, which is our wall-mounted energy storage solution. We have two models of flexible energy storage, the HLX and the CHLX. These are both 12-volt uh, batteries that can be used in parallel uh, as well as in series to get them up to uh, you know 24 or 48 volt uh, operating. And the CHLX is uh, fairly unique in that it includes uh, heaters that allow it to operate in colder temperatures than you would normally use uh, with lithium technologies or really lead acid for that matter. So it allows you to be uh, able to operate and charge even at lower than um, you know external temperatures lower than zero. Um, zero degrees C and, and um, you know, lower than freezing. 
So, um, you know, that's interesting. And then we have finally our PLC series, which is an advanced economical AGM type battery, but it's a pure lead carbon type battery that gives um, extended life for an AGM battery. Uh, and, uh, you know, excellent depth of discharge and everything. So the price performance on that is just outstanding. And then earlier today, we did a, a press release on uh, a couple of new products that we just introduced today, actually. The HLX and CHLX now come in a 1200 watt hour um, configuration as well. Uh, previously, we've had the 1800 and the 3600. These are a little bit smaller, lighter units that um, are, are suitable for some of the smaller applications out there. And uh, you know, it's a great it's a great addition to the product line. You probably have seen already uh, our our two main speakers. We have Nate Dooley, the technical sales rep, and we have Mar Marlon May, our technical support. And uh, we are ready to roll, guys. Why don't you uh, you know take it from here? Uh, Alrighty. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Um, I should now have control. Can everyone hear me? All right. I suppose you're in question and answer mode, but I, Marlon, I can Jay, hear you can hear yeah. me all right? Yep, I can hear you. Perfect. Five by five. All right. All righty, everyone. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, as Jay mentioned, we're going to talk uh, explicitly now about the kilovolt hab. We're going to work through um, some design considerations, installation, and then um, operation and commissioning. So here is a quick look at the specifications. As the name suggests, it is a seven and a half kilowatt hour unit. Um, a nominal 48 volts, um, which means it has to be used with a 48 volt um, inverter. Um, and then below this, we'll see the um, allowable charge and discharge current limitations. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Something notable about these batteries is their built-in Wi-Fi communication. So they can um, securely report um, data to the cloud. Um, we have a 6,000 um, cycle life rating at 80% DOD, and um, it is a wall-mounted battery. So you'll see the, the right picture shows the uh, mounting flange on the um, back of the battery, and it is a uh, hefty <laughs> battery at 208 pounds. Definitely a two-person job, at least, to get it up on the wall. Um, so as I mentioned, just a, a quick note about charge rate. Um, really with any lithium ion battery, um, the cycle life uh, is subject to change based on the way in which the, the batteries are charged and discharged. So at Kilovolt, what we've decided to do is break our warranty out into really two separate sections where we have an extended charge rate um, profile and an extended life profile. So what this, this says is if you are looking to take advantage of the absolute maximum charge and discharge ratings of 120 and 150 amps respectively. And the warranty period is a little bit less due to the fact that the, the battery does have um, a slightly reduced cycle life at those um, higher charge and discharge rates. The benefit of this is it allows customers who are needing a small bank, um, maybe they can only afford one battery to start or have uh, an excessively large PV array or inverter system um, to, to start with just one or two batteries um, uh, as opposed to adhering to the absolute um, uh, minimum recommended charge and discharge rate at 50, 50 and 120 amps. Um, and if you look at other lithium uh, ion battery manufacturers warranties, you'll see that they have similar limitations, but oftentimes it's a, it's a one tier system where you have you know, a hard limit at a certain amperage um, in order to uh, remain compliant with the warranty. Um, and even sometimes the BMS of those batteries will prevent you from going anywhere above that. Um, what we hope for is, you know, to provide more flexibility for the end user by giving um, them two different um, warranty profiles, depending on the, the usage of, or the treatment of the battery. So here is a quick look at the battery. You'll see on the front, um, another standout feature is the, the LCD um, uh, screen, which Marlon will go into uh, in more detail in a little bit. Um, and then 
It also has obviously your on off button you can see there and an LED state of charge indicator. So from across the room, you can get a rough reading of state of charge, which is nice. Um, and then the picture on the right is actually a side profile of the battery. It's the right side. Um, you'll see the um, DC terminals where your home runs um, will land. Um, we also have on the top a COM port um, for battery to inverter communication, which I will talk about in a minute here. And finally, we have our um, inter-battery COM port for um, HAB to other HAB communications there on the right. Um, so something important to know about these batteries is the scalability, um, which is a big selling point for a lot of people looking for lithium storage in general, the ability to start with one battery um, if that's all that budget allows, which oftentimes is the case, and eventually scale that up. Um, so whether you have one battery just being used for your most critical loads, you know, a fridge, router, fans, lighting, um, or you have a multi-stack of batteries for your whole home backup or an entirely off-grid system, all the way up to uh, 14 units in parallel is the maximum supported bank size, um, which could be uh, used even in a light commercial application. And as I've kind of alluded to, these batteries really can be used in any, um, any sort of system, whether it's a grid tied battery backup, um, a totally off grid system, an AC coupled uh, system where we're adding um, battery storage to an existing grid tied setup. Um, the batteries don't really care as long as the charge controllers and inverters are programmed accordingly. And that's um, something we wanted to highlight here where we, we really wanted this battery to be inverter agnostic. As I um, mentioned at the beginning, it is a 48 volt battery, so you need a 48 volt inverter. Um, but we support just about all of the, the major inverter brands on the market. The only requirement being that the um, inverter can be programmed to the set points recommended in the kilovolt manual, which, you know, as you probably, many of you probably know, absorption, float, low battery cutout, high battery cutout, current limitations, and so on. As long as those are programmable within the range or within the ranges of the um, kilovolt recommended set points, you're good to go. Um, so here's an example system from one of our customers with a um, Schneider XW, a couple um, Schneider 6150 charge controllers, and a single HAB. Um, we also have an example here from one of our customers in Puerto Rico uh, using a dual stack of HABs with a Solark 12K. So obviously um, 7.5 kilowatt hours each. With two of them, we get a total of 15 kilowatt hours of storage um, paired with the, uh, the Solark 12K. And finally, we have a example Outback system. This is from one of my customers actually up in New Hampshire. Um, this is a dual VFXR setup. Um, with uh, two Outback FM80s and obviously two halves there on the bottom. And something else to note, you'll see that they're using the, um, the Midnight Lithium battery combiner in between those two halves. Um, and the benefit of this is really um, allowing you to combine the um, respective positives and negatives from each um, hab using one aught conductors, um, keeping everything the same length as we recommend before um, taking your home runs off to the um, uh, inverters. I'll touch on that uh, a little bit more in the installation section here. So moving right along, we'll start with uh, unpacking. Um, like I mentioned, it's a heavy battery. <laughs> um, so it comes with the mounting plate you'll see on top, um, lifting handles, um, and those attached to the screws you can see in the bottom left there, the image. Um, also comes with all the hardware and then a couple COM cables. So important to note here, in the top left, you have your hab to hab communication cable, which with a single hab, you won't need. Also, we have our resistor plug, um, which with a single hab, you won't need. Those are only for um, multi-stack hab systems and I'll um, touch on that more in a second. And then finally in the bottom right, we do get a lot of questions about this. We ship all the HABs with our um, HAB to inverter Modbus cable, um, which is currently not supported, but will be later in Q1 um, with select hybrid inverters. So for the time being, you don't need to worry about that. Um, in terms of mounting the HAB, it's relatively easy. <laughs> if you have the um, uh, help necessary to get it up on the wall, you mount the, the wall bracket 
um, on a wall and um, hang the battery um, using that little flange you can see on the back there and screw it in and you're good to go. Um, so here we have uh, a pretty basic um, wiring diagram of a single HAB installation. It's really no different than any um, lead acid <laughs> battery um, uh, to inverter wiring. The only difference is that optional um, comm cable between the batteries and the inverter, as I mentioned. Um, a quick note, a uh, logistical note, I suppose, the um, terminals on the battery on the um, the bottom right there, as we showed that um, original side profile of it, um, the terminals can only um, handle up to one aught lugs. So we do um, uh, have one aught cables to sell with the, the halves oftentimes. Um, and if you're just going right to the inverter, you land your battery cables on the inverter and on the battery and you're good to go. If you have multiple um, batteries, it's important to keep them all, all of those one aught conductors the same length, which is why it's nice to have a central combiner box like that midnight lithium. Um, battery combiner box. Um, similarly, here we have a multi-hab system. You'll see each battery gets its own set of cables to a common bus, and then from those buses we have our home runs to our inverter, just like that um, uh, dual outback VFXR system I showed you a little bit ago. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to, to focus on here is that light blue wire on the top. Those are our HAB to HAB comm cables or inter-battery communication. You'll see the um, terminator plugs that come with the batteries uh, go on the first and last, the leader and the last follower battery in the um, bank. And um, you have the optional communication cable all the way on the left there. Um, and the reason why I wanted to touch on the HAB to HAB communications, because it is fairly unique um, and definitely a um, a great advantage in that the batteries are able to report their voltage to one another. And what this means is that if one battery, for um, example, let's say the leader battery is at a slightly higher voltage than the others, um, it is going to hold off, it is going to stop charging until the other batteries arrive at that same voltage, um, and then they'll all continue moving together. Same thing on the bottom end, if this battery um, senses it's at a lower voltage, it'll wait until the other batteries arrive. Um, which is really good when we have a, a large bank of batteries um, and also important for lithium cells in general, which do charge notoriously at different rates. You know, within the battery, the BMS is going to balance the, the 24 two volt cells in, inside the battery. Um, but without these have to have communications, there would be no way for the batteries to balance each other. Um, so that is a really nice feature. And what it also allows for is um, the leader battery to communicate all of the aggregate data from you know the whole bank of batteries to the inverter when um, we have battery to inverter communications. Speaking of which, so the first um, of our um, battery to inverter closed loop communications that we will support is the um, Schneider XW Pro. Um, and you'll see in the market um, today, a lot of uh, lithium batteries, lithium ion batteries are starting to um, uh, develop uh, closed or battery manufacturers are starting to develop closed loop communications. Um, and what this does is it allows the batteries to um, digitally report their um, voltage and state of charge and temperature data directly to the inverter instead of relying on the inverters um, uh, voltage sense at its terminals, um, which is really beneficial because then um, this way you're not, um, you don't need to be worried about voltage drop over your home run cables. The, the batteries are going to tell the inverter exactly what their voltage is, um, which ultimately um, uh, improves the uh, the charging profile of, of the batteries. Um, and beyond that, the inverter will understand what the protection settings um, uh, of the BMS are, and it will ensure that um, the batteries never reach those um, set points, whether it's its low voltage disconnect, it's low temperature disconnect, it's overcurrent disconnect, the inverter will be aware of those settings and be able to protect the batteries. Um, so the um, those are some of the benefits of closed loop communications in general. The other inverter we'll soon be supporting is the Solark 12K. Um, so very similar to the Schneider XW, you get um, improved state of charge control um, and optimized battery charging, um, whether it's a, a DC coupled 
um, solution, an AC coupled solution, on grid, off grid. Um, it, all all of these applications are are suitable for the um, for the setup. All right, so moving right along, we just wanted to show a, a brief um, diagram of a, a larger installation here. We have a five stack of batteries all going to their common buses. Um, and this is being um, used in a, in a three phase inverter setup. Ultimately, the batteries don't really care. Um, they're just looking at the DC side of the inverter. Um, here we do have um, a representation of um, closed loop communication. You'll see in the top left, we have a, a comm cable between our leader battery and our leader inverter. Um, and uh, this is a, a good example of how these batteries might be used in a, in a light commercial application. And with that, I am going to pass the ball to my colleague Marlon um, to take us through the operation um, and commissioning of the batteries. Marlon, I should be able to give you control here. I think you're good to go. Thank you very like much, Nate. Oh, there we go. Yep, there you go. Um, thank you very much. So we're going to go over the um, operation of the of the HAB right now. Um, we're going to go over commissioning. We're going to go over monitoring the HAB with and without habit to the app. Um, go over remote monitoring and also over the air updating. So. Um, for, as far as commissioning goes, there is really one thing that we are recommending for all um, for all HAB owners that when you get it, uh, you should do a state of charge calibration because um, uh, we have uh, it. Just make sure that um, what you are seeing as far as the uh, state of charge you know, corresponds correctly to the battery voltage. Um, so basically, you have to tell tell the BMS what a full charge is, what a um, and what a zero charge is, charge a completely discharged is. So fully charged the battery up to fifty six point four. So even if you get a high voltage alarm, um, keep going on up to fifty six point four. That alarm just tells you that you are getting kind of close to um, high voltage protection, but you um, at fifty six point four, you are still almost four volts away from high voltage protection. Um, now, in order to increase your state of charge accuracy, you can actually then, then discharge your battery all the way down to 49 volts. So in essence, what you have done is you have told the BMS where the uh, where a 100% uh, state of charge is and where a 0% state of charge is. Um, then you go ahead and charge the battery back up to its, um, to its uh, normal 56.4 volts and sh you uh, should be all set as far as um, calibration goes. Now, um, Nate mentioned briefly the, um, the kilovolt control panel. Um, basically, it gives you basic information about how your battery is performing, gives you the um, current battery voltage, um, given that voltage, the current kilowatt hours you have basically in the tank um, uh, tells you, um, in the next line down, it tells you what the, um, the amount that your battery is charging or discharging. Um, beside that is that uh, state of charge indicator. Um, and then next line below that tells you, you you're told what the um, uh, number of cycles there are on your battery and also what the battery's internal temperature are. Um, in the last line there, you'll notice that there's a battery, there's a run indicator just telling you that the battery is on and running. Um, in the very center there, that's the uh, power, um, it's the power button, and then that alarm light that I mentioned uh, just a moment ago. So the other way of monitoring your app is through the Habit um, mobile application. Um, it's available for both the Apple, through the Apple App Store and through the Google Play Store for Android. If, uh, for iOS, it needs to be um, iOS 11 or above. For Android, Android 5 or above. So as um, so Habit itself, what does, what does Habit actually 
um, enable will enables remote monitoring of your of your of your hab. It also allows you to do local monitoring without actually logging in to uh, Habit, and you can also share your you can also share your uh, hab with with others through Habit. So for local monitoring, um, on that on the login screen, you'd simply tap local connect and then scan the QR code on the um, on the hab or the same QR code its code is given to you on the side of the crate of the shrink crate. Um, and with that, you can also you'll then get access to the um, information on the hab, but it does not actually register the hab as belonging to you. Um, and there are detailed instructions for how to do local monitoring in the um, in the manual, in the habit manual, which is large enough to where we actually created a separate manual for the habit app. So for remote monitor monitoring, this you need to be logged into the into the app. Um, basically, you'll end up connecting first, connecting your phone to the Hab's um, Wi-Fi access point. And then using that, you'll then connect your HAB to your local Wi-Fi network. Uh, when that's done, then you can go ahead and monitor the HAB from wherever your phone or your mobile device has an internet connection. Also, once you have registered the HAB as yours, you can then share it using the, um, the, using the HAB uh, QR code. The, well, this is, um, this is an advantage because if you're an installer, you can then share the HAB with the with the customer and allow them to monitor their batteries, monitor their HAB from where they from where they are. Um, also, vice versa, there there are those cases where the where the customer really wants to have primary control over their over their um, over their HAB, in which case they can then share it to you. Um, why would you want to do this? Well, it definitely can allow you to, to save a truckle. You can actually get, um, see what's going on with the battery without having to actually go on site. So we're going to just go over briefly how to set up, create an account. On the login screen, um, when you fire up Habit, in the, the, um, in the middle of the uh, lower part of the screen, there is a sign up button. You go ahead and click that. Um, enter your email, um, enter uh, at which point uh, Kilovolt will send you an, a code that you'll then enter into, um, enter where it says enter code. And then you'll go ahead and set your, set your password. You're then um, ready to go ahead and add a battery. In which case you, first you click the add battery um, button and because this is a quirk of the um, of the habit app that has not uh, that's it's still there but should be corrected. The um, when you click add battery, you then also then have to click add battery again in the upper um, <laughs> in the upper right hand corner. Then once that's done, you go ahead and scan the, the battery's QR code, which once again can be found on the left-hand side along with the uh, battery label or on the, um, on the HAB shipping crate. Um, at which point you then may need to make sure that the HAB is turned on. Then you'll go ahead and um, and you go ahead, we'll go ahead and pair, go ahead and pair your hab. First with the pair your hab with the with your with your phone, and then you'll select the, your local Wi-Fi network in order to connect the hab to the Wi-Fi network. Once it's done, you'll end up with a battery list, a list of all of your habs. In this case, we have just showing one because we're just for a, a single test hab. But if you have more than one, they will all appear in this battery list. If you want for any particular battery, you go ahead and select the battery info icon highlighted in the upper right-hand corner there. At which point you'll then, it'll then load up a basic info screen where you are, 
able to view the battery's general state of health. Um, you can, uh, you'll get to see the, the battery's, um, um, its voltage, its uh, state of charge, and um, Sorry about, sorry about that, I was distracted for just a moment and you'll get to see what the capacity is, what the basic, what the battery has, has in the tank. There's also a place there, a remote um, standby switch that you can use if you need to momentarily um, stop the battery from charging or discharging. You can go ahead and click that slider switch at which point then the battery will display a status of no charge, no discharge. Um, just remember to click it back um, uh, when you are done. I wouldn't, if you really need to do um, work on your system, I would not depend upon this. I would go ahead and actually um, uh, clip the, flip the breaker on the side of the battery in order to disconnect your battery from, your, from, the, um, from your system. Now you can also have um, you can also view advanced info by clicking the middle icon there in that gray bar at the top, um, where you can see uh, the amount of current that your current that is your battery is receiving or, or dis um, the amount that you're charging or discharging current. Um, you can get the battery's internal temperature and you also can get the number of cycles on your battery. On the, the left hand, the right hand um, uh, icon there will actually show you um, log details where um, events that your battery has uh, generated show up here. So what do you want to do if you want to sh uh, share your HAB? Well, first you select the HAB from your HAB you want to share from your list. You click on the share icon at which point a um, the app will generate a one-time only QR code that you can then use to share with another person, but it can only go be used by one other person. And that's good for like 30 minutes. Unfortunately, um, Habit does not allow you to share that directly from Habit. You'll need to take a screenshot of it and send it to your send it to the other person. And then once it's um, shared, you once it's shared, you can then view the um, the status of that of that app. It'll actually all of the batteries that you have shared will show up in the shared sharing status list. Now, over the air updates, once you have connected your hab to your to your um, your local to your local Wi-Fi network, then um, your HAB is then able to receive automatic updates um, from Kilovolt. This is our way of kind of future-proofing your, um, your HAB as, um, as, as, part of, you know, as part of continuing, um, continuing improvements. When we make an update to the firmware, we can then go ahead and push that out to your HAB. The customer really doesn't have to do anything. It happens automatically. And uh, that is it for operations. Like I, as Nate said before, we'll be able to, we'll be answering more questions in the, um, in the um, networking session. Well, we've actually, later on today. You know, we have some time available now and we do have quite a few questions that are queued up. I've been answering uh, a number of them as, as we've been going through it, but we may want to take a look at that. Uh, and I don't know, Nate or Marlon, which one of you'd like to, uh, to answer some of these, but why don't you go ahead Take a look at the Q and A and yep. uh, fire away. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tackle Glenn Burtz here. He asked asked about about um, the closed loop communications with the XW Pro if it's part of Zenbus. So your connections to your XW Pro are are through the gateway. Um, so when, since that information is now being delivered to the gateway, you now Schneider is actually finalizing right now how that info will be displayed. Um, in uh, um, other parts of your of your Zen bus network, um, I don't believe it will show up in the SCP. Um, 
it will be displayed as part of the um, in the gateways local UI. I don't know how it will be displayed if you're using um, using Insight. Okay, well that that'll be something uh, that perhaps in the next session with Schneider, they, they can answer that or again in the, uh, in the networking session. Yep. Okay. I'm going to skip around and hop over to um, uh, saw a question about estimated um, charge time. And of course, I can't find it now. But I think the, the question was, um, what's the estimated um, time for the initial commissioning charge? Um, ultimately, it depends on the charger you're using. Oftentimes, what I'd say is if you had, for example, um, three halves uh, stacked in um, in parallel with, let's say, uh, a Radian um, 8K inverter, what you would probably do is use the integrated charger of the Radian um, and just charge each hab uh, separately. Um, and if we think about the hab being, you know, 150 amp hour battery, shipping maybe at 60% state of charge or so, um, you know, that means you need to charge uh, roughly 120, 110 um, from 110 amp hours or so. So if you're charging using um, uh, the 50 or 60 amp recommended charge rating for um, uh, the extended life uh, span of the battery, you can expect uh, a good hour to get it up to 100%. And then probably depending on the rate of discharge, another two or three hours to discharge it fully. So really, all you need to do is take the total amp hour capacity of the bank and divide by your charging amperage DC. Um, ultimately limited by the, the size of the inverter and charger. Okay, that was uh, Alexa's question, I believe. And I got it. One has, uh, has answered. I have an answer, a question here from Pam. She's asking if the cab can be charged, recharged with a generator for an off-grid system. Absolutely. Basically, you would do that through your, um, through your inverter charger because you do need to be able to uh, set your um, set your charger to the charging specs for the hab. You would not connect the, you would not connect your generator directly to the hab. That is not something you would do. Great. Um, I'll clarify um, Joe um, Utasi. I apologize if I butchered the pronunciation there. I'll clarify that question, Joe. Um, Sorry, one second. Um, lithium ion versus lithium iron phosphate. It's a good question. We didn't really touch on the chemistry in this presentation, but it is a lithium iron phosphate battery. Um, lithium ion is a catch all for a number of different um, lithium chemistries. So when we talk about lithium iron phosphate versus lithium cobalt oxide, for example, those are both lithium ions. Um, we employ lithium iron phosphate chemistry for a number of reasons, principally due to safety. Um, there's no risk of thermal runaway with lithium iron phosphate batteries. Um, they're also a fairly low cost um, and high cycle life um, solution. And that's, that's why we, um, we use that as opposed to others like lithium cobalt oxide. Um, there's a question here from, Her from Herbelto. He's asking um, what counts as a cycle on the, um, on the HABs? A cycle is defined as being a total 80% depth of discharge and then recharge. Um, um, so it's when it, that's basically it. It's, it, it's um, so if you have multiple, like multiple uh, very shallow discharges, it takes, it'll, it'll start, it'll count them up until you get 80% and then it'll go ahead and that'll count as a cycle or a single 80% depth of discharge and then recharge. That'll also, that'll also be a cycle. Okay. Um, I see a question about prismatic or cylindrical. Marlon, they are prismatic cells. They are, they are, they are prismatic. Um, Bert, he, um, Glenn, he's asking, no, Will it work with the XW Plus or only the XW Pro? As of right now, it is just the XW Pro. 
And I think that's somewhat because of Schneider's um, uh, you know, product planning themselves. It's not something- Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah, and it, it, that was referring to closed loop communication, right, Marlon? So right. Um, the it, it is compatible with the, the XW plus itself. Um, yes. You just won't get closed loop communication. That's, yeah, thank you very much for that clarification, Nate. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, I see a couple questions from uh, Howie Michelson about the charge rate. Um, you might have hopped on a little bit late. It was one of the first slides we went over. Um, the recommended, the, the maximum allowable charge rate is, is roughly a, a C1, um, or sorry, discharge rate is roughly a C1. Um, to, to get the best lifespan out of the battery, it works out to about a, a C2.5, yeah, which is a, a 50 or uh, even a C3, about a 50 amp um, max recommended charge rate. Ah, so. Alexis is asking, you know, for the app to work, does it have need to be connected to the internet? Um, no, but let me qualify that. If you want to be able to view the status of the HAB remotely, like away from the site, then in which case then you do need to, um, then do need to, uh, have it connected to the cloud. If you are just working with the HAB, like you're right next to it or within the HAB's, um, HAB's local access point Wi-Fi range, you can actually uh, just view the, HAB, uh, view the HAB locally, view its information locally without having it actually being connected to the cloud. And in that, in that, mar in that scenario, Marlon, correct me if I'm wrong, then you're connecting to the HAB's internal Wi-Fi. Right, you connect you connect your mobile device to the HAB's internal Wi-Fi. Exactly. So you'd have to just switch which Wi-Fi network you were on, and and make sure it's the battery that you were interested in. That is that is true. Yes. Um, I'll hop in and answer uh, Daryl's question um, in regards to the commissioning charge. Um, Fifty-six point four volts is the the recommended absorb voltage. Um, we, to get to 100% state of charge, if you know the manual um, recommended absorb time, I believe Marlon, two minutes or less, depending on charge rate. Um, right. So pretty much once you've reached 56.4, the batteries are effectively full. Um, I would say refer to the manual for um, recommended absorb time given charge rate, but for the commissioning charge, once you get each to 56.4, they should be all pretty close. You know, we're talking 97 to 100% state of charge. Right, yeah, with these with these batteries, they don't really need to absorb like other chemistries do um, uh, once you're there at the voltage, it's it is actually it's fully charged. Okay, there's a very question here from Gail. In commissioning, can the phone be phone in quotes? be one that can only interface with a Wi-Fi signal, but not have cell service. So I guess if you're out in a remote location, can you still communicate to the HAB with a phone? And I think the answer oh, yeah. is you're, that's through the way we were just talking about, right? Yes, you would, you would be connecting to the HAB doing local connect. Um, your mobile device, um, your mobile device will connect to it. You'll connect it to the HAB's um, Wi-Fi, it creates its own local access point. That way you can actually then view the um, HABs information uh, on that local device without having to, um, without having to connect out to the cloud. Right. One other question that's on the phone thing from Kurt says, I have 11 HABs, but only an iPhone 8S. So I guess there is no HAB. So that's a, that's a little thing the iOS version I think we're yes. just seven. But it's 11. Yes. 11 will run on an iPhone 8. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I believe so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I believe so. Yes. An iPhone 6S, you can go right to the latest with that. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, um, the operating system, not the model that was 11. Yes. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, David is asking um, whether or not 
uh, to think that Wi-Fi is not as stable as people might hope. Um, it asks if, if Ethernet is available. Um, Ethernet, an Ethernet connection is not available with the, with the HAB. Right, there's no hardwire. Uh, there's no hardwire, there's no hardwire option. So um, if you, so I'll if you, in. oh, sorry. So if you're, if you're, if your HAB is, uh, you know, if your installation site is like away a for the, um, away from the, uh, away from your local networks um, base station, you might, it would be worth your while to actually um, use a Wi-Fi extender or Wi-Fi booster in order to be able to make sure you have a nice solid connection uh, to the HAB. Um, we, we, we did that, uh, actually, we know that works because we did that ourselves when we were testing. Okay. Um, another question from Gail, does Setpoint need any temperature compensation? No, it does not. You, you do not need to do any um, temperature compensation with the HAB. Um, so if, you, if it requires that you put it in, then you put it in as uh, zero degrees per millivolt. Put zero de yeah, Z uh, zero millivolts per degree. I'll answer a couple of quick ones here. Um, a good question actually from Andrew. Can you, Andrew, excuse me, can you hook an MPPT charge controller up to the HAB? Yes, absolutely. We spent yes. a lot of time focused on the inverter charger side of things, but yes, these can be DC coupled without issue. Um, a lot of the set points are um, pretty much the same um, as you would for the, the AC charger of an inverter. You just need to make sure that the um, absorb float voltage, absorb time, um, are programmed according to the to the kilovolt hub uh, specs. And then one other quick one from Joe. Um, a good question, does partial charge discharge like a real off-grid scenario affect battery life? Um, one of the, the benefits of lithium iron phosphate, they're really not um, concerned about getting a nice full charge and discharge cycle as you would be with a, a lead acid battery. There's no sulfation, which is really the, the reason to to do you know not only equalizing but also regular charging and discharging um lithium iron phosphate batteries actually like to sit in a partial state of charge um you know if they're sitting at 80 90 percent state of charge that's where they're happy um so no there is there is no risk at all to um to not fully um charging recharging the batteries aside from not you know taking advantage of the full capacity and there's there's no um risk of letting them sit in a partial state of charge if you think about it um if you're discharging from 100% to um, 90% every day, you know that's not a cycle. But after um, eight days, <laughs> you would get um, the equivalent of one cycle, having you know used 10% of the battery capacity eight days in a row. That would count as one one cycle, roughly. Uh, let's see here. Um... Gary, Gary asks, you know, here, um, that both states that, no, Solak wants to know battery efficiency, resistance and efficiency. Um, what you can use is actually that information is in the, um, is in the manual. So you can, um, I believe it's a 95% efficiency and I, but I don't remember offhand what the battery resistance is. Um, and uh, regarding a solar settings, sheet that is um we were actually waiting for a few things to get in place but we got, that is going to be that is going to be created um do we have a more detailed voltage to state of charge graph uh we don't as a uh, we don't have a more detailed voltage to state of charge graph um uh can definitely check and see if we can get one but the one we have right now is the one we have Okay, uh, another question on Wi-Fi. Does the HAB work with any Wi-Fi, 2.4 or 5 gigahertz? Yes, um, it does. Works with either, yeah. It works with either, yes. Yeah, 
another one from O'Neill asks if this if you can do a software habit ha software update if the habit is not connected to the web. No, you cannot. Um, the only way they are be, are delivered is uh, through the cloud. Uh, good question from our friend Stefan um, in regards to the initial commissioning charge. Um, is it something that you only need to do once or is it advisable to do it from time to time to recalibrate? Um, I would say you shouldn't you shouldn't have to do it. Um, I wouldn't plan to do it because of the battery to battery or inter battery communication. Hopefully, um, once they have been calibrated initially, their voltages um, or they'll be able to, to regulate their voltages and balance um, each other. It, you know, if, if you have to, if you notice there is an imbalance um, big enough that the, the um, habs aren't taking care of it for whatever reason, the first step yeah, would be to do a calibration charge, but the hope is that you, you wouldn't have to after the initial one. Right. Now, if you do start to notice a, a hab state of charge, um, it, it basically it's a, it's a, it's a calculated value. Just notice it start, that it starts to drift. Um, um, and it's showing a, showing a different value than what the um, than what you're seeing for the other batteries that are at the same voltage. Um, if you wish, you can go ahead and do a another recalibration um, in order to try to get it back in line. But that state of charge um, that's being displayed that is for us humans to look at the actual. Um, that actually have itself is operating on the battery voltage, um, the amount of current in and out, uh, internal battery temperatures. The, the BMS is making decisions based on that. It's not making decisions based upon the state of charge that is either displayed on the um, display or through the app. Yeah, that's a really important distinction, Marlon. I'm glad you mentioned that because when you're looking at the, the batteries in terms of um, being concerned about imbalances, you should be looking at the voltages of the batteries. You know, if, if, if the voltages are the same, then the batteries are balanced. If the state of charges are different, even though the voltages are the same, it just means that you need to do a, like Marlon said, a full charge and discharge all together so that the battery or the BMS knows what 100% is and what 0% is. But as long as the voltages are all the same, then the batteries are actually balanced. Just looking at the time here, folks, and uh, we are getting close to the to the wrap up time. Uh, we're going to have plenty of time at the three o'clock session, the open networking session. So be sure to join us there and we can answer questions face to face there. So in that session, if you hadn't been to one uh, the last two days, it's um, we're going to be breaking up into different uh, rooms, essentially like virtual rooms. And you can go from room to room, depending on which um, uh, which team you'd like to talk to. And then you're going to be able to have your video on and audio and you can just, you know, talk naturally back and forth instead of just doing the Q&A thing. We've got over 100 people on the session today, so it's hard to do that back and forth with 100 people. <laughs> but uh, we'll have we'll have fewer when we get into the other rooms there. So why don't we pick maybe one last question to answer now. Um, and and uh, then we'll wrap it up for today and we will continue on uh, afterwards in the, uh, in the other session. Uh, I can take the last one. one. Sure. Sure, yeah. Um, Edward, he asks if the Sunny Boy um, is able to connect directly to the, um, if, they kill, if the Hab is able to connect directly to the Sunny Boy gateway. Um, mm, that is not something that we've, tested now if like for example I don't if you if the sunny boy is connected to um, to the internet can the can the can the hab get to the internet through the sunny boy my instinct is to say no that that would not that would not work that the hab would need to be connected in and of itself to your local Wi-Fi network and just as the sunny boy would have to be connected in and of itself to your little Wi-Fi network but I don't believe you can use one of to get one to get to the other. Okay. Um, Nate, did you want to answer one last one and then and then we can wrap up? Uh, sure. Um, 
Oh, I had one, and of course I uh, lost it here. Um, a good question um, about uh, the SOC calibration um, from Rod. What triggers the, the state of charge calculation to reset to 100? Um, he mentioned that on the CHLX batteries that um, the uh, HLX app, the, that version of the app, needs to really get up to 14.1. Um, otherwise, it'll sit at 99% state of charge. The <laughs> the answer to that is um, sounds like a cop out, but I really would say don't fixate too much on the state of charge um, because the the state of charge might not always perfectly correlate to um, the the voltage when the the batteries are at like i said originally their absorbed voltage for a couple of minutes in this case 56.4 for a couple of minutes they're full the the state of charge might show 98 99 percent state of charge um and that kind of is what it is like marlon said that's really only for your um you the users um uh knowledge uh, of the system if they're not showing 100 percent state of charge it's not going to impact system performance in any way um it's it's really just i mean I me mean, as a fairly type a ocd person it would it, it would maybe get to me that it was at 99 percent, not quite at 100 but it's not going to impact the system functionality at all okay well thanks uh thanks guys thanks nate and, and marlon and thank you everybody for joining us here uh, we're going to wrap this up right now. Right after this is the Scheider session. So if you go into the email that you received uh, from us, then you should be able to click into that one. And if you had any of the additional questions on the Schneider interface, you can ask them there. Okay. Thanks again, everybody. And we'll see you hopefully at three o'clock. Take care. Take care, everyone.